All right, we're doing it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Mr. Brown's AP Human Geography class. Today, I'm going to go through the Prezi New Urban Strategies. Uh, this Prezi is directly related to the 2017 FRQ number one, which nationally, 42% of students received a zero out of seven, and the average was a one out of seven. The students that I taught that year got two out of seven as an average on the FRQ. Uh, I've already made sort of an adjustment to this same FRQ, sort of modified it to be at the 2020 standard. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I do have an FRQ that directly correlates to this uh, uh, Prezi I'm about to go through. So if you if you do that FRQ and you, you do good on it, it means, means you learned something. So uh, I'll probably also make a video to sort of review what I hope to see on that FRQ. And uh, I'll get there when we get to it. But right now, let's learn some stuff. New urban strategies. Okay, so check it out. Ooh, oh, oh, look at this beautiful city. Oh, man, this is this is so much new urbanism. I'm going to talk about why this picture is so important and how it's literally going to save the world. And then, oh, look at what all these people are doing. They're hanging out. They're walking. You know, there's some cars, but not a lot of cars. And, uh, yeah, a lot of green space. And it looks like there's, oh, look, there's some shops here on this floor, like the first floor. And then in the second, third, fourth floor, this is probably where people live. Oh, man, this is literally what I'm going to talk about all day today. All right. So uh, let's review city zoning real quick. Uh, this is something I went through in an earlier presentation. But a big part of new urban strategies is they take the idea of city zoning and just throw it in the trash can. Because most uh, cities in the United States, and probably most of the world for that matter, uh, the city planners decide what each section of the city will be used for. So a piece of land could be for commercial, for residential, for industrial, for agriculture, for public space, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the only thing you got to know is this is the old way of doing things. They're switching it up in new urbanism. And uh, that's that's really what we're, we're going for here. So... The, the old traditional way, yeah, you got your uh, residential zone, your industrial zone, your commercial zone, and some of these laws can be really stringent, you know? Like, uh, I think I got a video of, of a kid trying to have a lemonade stand in their front yard, and they're like, this is not appropriate, you're breaking the law, because this, is this isn't commercial land, this is residential land. And then the lemonade stand kid's like, what the heck? So it's pretty sad. Um... Okay, yeah, and then this is the uh, old high school I taught at in uh, Las Vegas. So you see sort of the zoning here. All this is residential. But then over here, you got some public land, uh, Cashman Center. That's commercial, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's sort of what you're looking at. Um, what else we got here? City zoning, that's Chicago. And then, yep, here's just more examples of city zoning. City zoning, this is the old way of doing things. We're, we're done with it. Okay. So uh, most American cities are also set up without a lot of housing in the downtown area. In the central business districts of most American cities, the way they were designed was to be entirely commercial or to just have a whole lot of land for, uh, you know, where they're going to put big office buildings. And cities were designed that people would live in houses way over there in the San Fernando Valley and they would drive into Los Angeles every single day. So, uh, yeah, they really, this is a bad way of designing cities, we found out. And new urbanism is going to throw all that out of the, uh, out of existence. Okay. So no longer this, this downtown where only people work. So yeah, here's Los Angeles for you. And then what do you got here? So here's some industrial zone near the downtown area as well. Uh, new urbanism doesn't really like industrial zones at all. Oh, oh, climate change. So, yeah, that, those are going to be gone. All right, so let's keep talking about the old way of doing things, because in order to understand what new urbanism is, you got to know how it used to be. So after World War II, city planners used all those traditional practices, and they designed people to live in these vast residential zones of one- to two-story houses that are typically now suburbs. But uh, I, I know, like, for example, in Los Angeles, there were... Uh, like Venice and, uh, uh, oh, shoot. Oh, how do I not remember where Jordan grew up now? Um, but anyway, there's all those little suburbs of Los, uh, Los Angeles 
They uh, were designed to just be these commuting zones. That's where people would live. They would work downtown. And as these living zones got further and further spread out away from the downtown, they became known as suburbs because they were sort of now their own little sub-cities of these bigger cities. Uh, And most Americans live in this style. Uh, Here in Las Vegas, almost every kid lives in a almost suburb zone because we're all pretty darn far away from the Strip or downtown Fremont Street. And yeah, they're usually driving these really long distances every single day. And yep, this is just what these cities are all about. And let's talk about some problems with the traditional zoning system. This traditional system makes it so that everybody has to own a car. And everybody has to drive really far into and out of work every day. And I think the average person in Los Angeles, man, they're stuck in traffic for like two hours a day. And when you're in traffic, oh God, life just sucks. So really, new urbanism is seeing the problems with the way we've designed cities like this and saying, let's throw all that in the dumpster. So let's, uh, if you still got to take some notes on this slide, you can... You know, stop the video or whatever, but let's keep it going. So anyway, city versus suburb. Two very different styles, obviously big, tall commercial buildings where people work and tiny buildings where people live, and they're totally separate. And this is a problem. It needs a whole lot of infrastructure. You got to have uh, some way of driving to get to this downtown area and people live over here. Um Yeah, and you just see that, you know, you got to have all these big freeways to get people to and from. City's super spread out. And what else we got here? Traffic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is Los Angeles. I've been on this freeway myself. And then, yep, these super spread out uh, uh, suburb zones. This is where most people live in Las Vegas nowadays. And then the growing commute. As time has gone on, it takes us longer and longer to get to work every day. And life is a struggle traffic oh my goodness traffic i hate my life uh okay now let's start getting into the new stuff so still still haven't gotten officially to new urbanism yet but we're getting there uh in the start of the 2000s many downtown areas around the united states and really around the world for that matter were falling apart because of the new international division of labor people aren't doing as much work in the united states anymore like Sometimes there were factories in downtown areas, hashtag Detroit, but not so much anymore. And these old factories and these old big shopping malls weren't as hustle and bustle as they used to be. And so there are all these empty old buildings downtown and people started to be like, hey, why don't we reuse these old space and build some trendy new houses and businesses? And this concept of converting these old trash houses into some kind of super fancy, ooh, cool house is called gentrification. This is a big word you got to know. And yeah, what gentrification is, is you take an old building and you convert it into a new fancy building. So it's like super remodeling. But also a part of gentrification is this. It might change the character of the neighborhood. And I've got all kinds of pictures here to show show you what I mean. Um, sometimes the old downtown, you know, I'm saying it's quote, quote, crappy. Well, usually it kind of is, but the old downtowns, they have some character to them. Okay. Like they have some history related to them. And also, uh, a lot of times downtown tended to be cheaper to live there in the past. But if a developer buys one of these old buildings, makes it super fancy, they're going to charge some big money rent. And that can cause a lot of trouble in the community because people are like, hey, I used to pay $300 a month for this house. Now it's 1000 What the heck? Um, and yeah, so this policy, uh, I, I've even got some videos about this. Typically what happens is uh, it, it, it's, it's almost always a racial thing. A white person buys these old buildings, fancies it up, and minority communities are like, whoa, you're taking our space. What the heck? Um, I know this is a big deal in Los Angeles and in San Diego, and I've heard some stuff about it in New York as well. And uh, yeah, these, I call them the hipster types. Uh, They cause these housing prices of the community to dramatically increase and really changes the character of the community. makes a lot of people really pissed off. 
So, yep, that's gentrification. It's not always racial, but I think almost every example I've seen, it's been it's been turned into a racial thing. So, gentrification, kids. Yeah, I'll also teach you about redlining and blockbusting later. Those are also very racial. Uh, okay, everybody cool with gentrification? If you need more time on the slide, stop it now. So, let's check it out, what I'm talking about. All right. So this is before gentrification and then after gentrification. So you're like, oh, Mr. Brown, this building looks a lot better. Well, yeah, for the most part it does. But if this building used to charge $200 a month in rent for people to live there, now they charge 1000 it's definitely going to change the character of the neighborhood. Um, and then also here, you know, you've got this, uh, these two kind of old school restaurants, like this one, Southern Fried Chicken. MG Diner, Old Fashioned Good, Soul Food, and then it got converted into what's probably an artesian bar, and then, yeah, this place got converted into a subway, so these are also examples of gentrification. They change the character of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, and also this one, too, so this uh, old building converted into this fancy yellow building, and then, you know, gentrification, gentrification, old school. Uh, what else we got here? Uh... I'm not entirely sure what this place is about, but it's now probably a Apple store. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, and then, yep, Starbucks. Whenever some place gets gentrified, you're always going to see a Starbucks. Well, not always, but for the most part. And then what else you got here? So, yep, as things switch up, you see the evolution of gentrification. And it, it seems like fixed-geared bicycles always show up whenever there's gentrification. And then vegetable garden, dried fruit, Joe's Pizza. It's now gelato cum ulta volta. I, I don't know what that is. Um, okay, so key traits of gentrification. Changing character of the neighborhood. Rising property values. Displacing poor. Usually has a, a, a racial element. Increasing the homeless population. Loss of low-income housing in inner cities. Definitely disrupts social network. Definitely creates a lot of tension. There's like... Wealthy people right next to people in poverty. And something else that I've just, I keep seeing it more and more is people who like get involved in gentrification always bring their dang dogs. Like there's, whenever they gentrify someplace, they always build like a dog park or like a, like a thing for dogs. Like dog grooming goes up everywhere too. And typically, the people who can afford these gentrified spots in the middle of an inner city, these are uh, you know, college-educated people working downtown. They don't want to commute. They don't want to have to drive to work, so they will pay that big money to live near downtown. And they usually don't have kids, so instead they have a dog. And uh, there's this great term that a uh, AP reader guy taught me. Uh, when there's uh, a boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe, heck, they're married, you know, they would be called a dual-income couple. And dual-income, no kids. Uh, dinks. <laughs> dual-income, no kids. So they could, you would call them a dink, and I think that's just a funny term. Um, all right, so let's check it out what gentrification looks like. So... Uh, gentrification, a process which middle-class people take residential areas, traditionally working-class area of a city, changing the character of an area. And, I mean, there, there is this debate we should, we should have and probably will exist on the FRQ. Is gentrification a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, you know, you saw some of those pictures that those, uh, a lot of those buildings were definitely not up to building code, but... The question is, when they remodel those old buildings, where do the people who used to live there go? And yeah, that is a concern. Um, another thing, more more stuff for rich people, more condoberg. Oh man, condominiums. That's a part of gentrification. And then, uh, yeah, uh, Washington, D.C. is absolutely an example where a lot of gentrification is happening right now. And Washington, D.C. used to be a majority African-American city. Well, especially in, like, I think it's the north part. Um, but now uh, a lot of these political people are moving in and they're not giving a lot of low-income opportunities to people to live in D.C. anymore. Um, yeah, gentrification displaces people. Absolutely true. Condos kill culture. Yeah, I mean, you know, what would you rather have, the soul food store or the Starbucks? Uh, gentrification is class warfare. Oof, yeah, yeah, kind of true. I see white people 
<laughs> funded by gentrification. Um, and yeah, this is the whole idea too. This is the old inner city, and here comes the new inner city on the fixed geared bicycle. Oh man, craft beer. That's lattes. All this is very, very relevant to this topic. And then yeah, this used to be a train yard, and uh, trains in the United States aren't as big as they used to be. So they converted it into this green space, and they're changing it up, gentrifying the whole place. So making it a, a fancier downtown, trying to get people to live there. Um, okay, so yeah, infill development. This is also another term you could see. So for example, uh, right here, this is a you know old train yard. Maybe these are some old train buildings. By converting this old dead space into this apartment zone, probably kind of expensive apartments with this fancy park. This is called infill. You are infilling the city rather than growing it outwardly. So uh, uh, yeah, and well, you could even do this within your own house because uh, I do have a friend who had a pretty big backyard and was like, you know what? I'm just gonna build another house in my backyard and sell it. And yeah, that's another example of infill where you're not growing the overall border of a city you're just building more buildings within the city already um yeah and sort of this is what infill is trying to stop urban sprawl if a city just keeps growing and growing and growing eventually it's just going to consume nature and that's absolutely true with los angeles you know i remember this story i was uh driving two of my friends from amsterdam from san diego to santa barbara and we have to drive through los angeles and it's just, it's just an endless city, an endless sprawl of buildings. And they kept asking me, like, are we in Los Angeles yet? And I honestly didn't know because, like, the, the border is not very clear. And I don't know, is Irvine Los Angeles? I think it is. So, yeah, it's uh, some weird stuff. And then, yep, there they are, infilling. So you take these old, uh, probably not very used parking lots and you take this, I guess, this grass field. Now that's where you're going to build rather than grow out the city. And then, ooh, look at that. Just building a garden on top of your city, too. So, you know, it's like, oh, you're going to get rid of the public park. Well, put the park on top of the building. How about that? Oh, this building is called the Vertigo Bosco, by the way. Uh, super cool building in Italy. Um, and then, yep, map of Detroit. What happened? Um, so, yeah, these uh, parts of the city were kind of the downtown area that was sort of not very well cared for. But now they're starting to infill it and build up the city of Detroit from the inside. And then, ooh, I want to read this. So this is, uh, here we go. My land has more value when you own it. You're invited to the neighborhood association. I've never seen the welcome mat. You move to my neighborhood for diversity. You don't do a damn thing to diversify your own hometown. You stroll carefree through my neighborhood. I'm arrested while driving through yours. You buy your house, evict me from my dream home. You move in and buy right stop stock in my Nana's number one ingredient, affordable. Bike lanes go up where there's always been bikes, just brown riders. See, there's a racial element to this. Hundreds of you are never a mob. Two of us are a gang. Ooh, man. The city installs new lights at Dolores Park for you, builds a new jail at 17th and Valencia for me. You think this poem is a joke? I don't care what you think, but I have to. Yeah, so... There is a negative side of all this gentrification. It's where did the people who live, used to live there go? And then, yep, here's a gentrified looking building. And then this is a hipster. Oh man, the, the white guy, beard, the, l shoes with no socks, wearing a he man handbag. I'm sure he has a fixed gear bicycle tattoo on his leg. Oh man, I've, I've got some serious hipster stories. And then here's a map of where a lot of gentrification is happening in the United States. As you can see, Seattle, San Francisco, New York, D.C., uh, Boston. Those are some pretty big ones. Um, okay, so, yeah, funny anecdote. <laughs> yeah, dinks. I already said this. Dual income, no kids, but a dogs. So uh, why are dogs so commonly seen with gay couples and couples with no kids? Well, it's uh, a dog is like a practice baby, is what I've always heard. And so I, I just think this is a really funny thing. That whenever there's gentrification, there's always going to be young couples with dogs. They're practice babies. So 
This is what you'll see in gentrification. People hanging out at a dog park. Oh, look, it's a dog park. There's a, this is a dog park on, like, the 20th floor of a building. And then, yeah, here's here's some dogs hanging out on the roof. And then, yep, there they are. The family photo. Oh, these, these dinks. Look at them go. There they are, just dinking away at life. And, yeah, it's always in the Christmas photos, too. And then, yeah, that, that was me in Austin. I found, I found some dinks. They're everywhere. Um, okay, finally, we get to the whole point of this Prezi. New urbanism. And I have to make this incredibly clear, because you'll get it wrong on the FRQ. New urbanism is not gentrification. But the reason why I taught it is because they're kind of related. Okay? So, in the later 1990s, some urban planners saw what gentrification was doing and said, hey, gentrification is like putting a band-aid on some of these problems within our city. What if, whenever we make a brand new city, we just take all that advice from gentrification, from the failure of traditional planning, and use those thoughts to build a perfect city? And that's what new urbanism is. Gentrification is one building at a time. New urbanism is your starting over fresh from the beginning. Way bigger scale than gentrification ever could be. But it has a lot of the same ideas and goals. Okay? So new urbanism. Gonna create a brand new city, solving a lot of the problems that traditional zoning made and that gentrification attempts to solve. So let's check it out. All right. This is what a new urbanism kind of city would look like. Notice every building is like probably five stories tall or more. There's a lot of green space. People are walking around. And where did the cars go? There's only one car. Hmm. And here's the, the sort of scape design of new urbanism. There's none of that suburban area that everybody in the United States lives in. All the people, all the commercial residents, all the industry is really tightly packed close together. You build the city up. You don't build it out. That's new urbanism. New urbanism hates cars. So whatever you can do to get rid of cars, new urbanism will love you. Okay, here's um, some more stuff. You're like, well, Mr. Brown, there are cars. Yeah, but rather than have two, three cars per household, you got one car. And you shouldn't use it that much. And also a whole lot of green space. Like I'll tell you, Los Angeles and Las Vegas, not a lot of green space. Not a lot of opportunities for people to walk or bicycle. And new urbanism loves that too. All right. Here's some other stuff about new urbanism. So you can see you're packing society closer together. Okay. So new urbanism completely challenges the idea that tradition, that commercial zoning and residential zoning needs to be separated. In a perfect new urbanism design, every single piece of land is mixed-use development. Now, probably not really for industry so much, because industry could cause some pollution, could be kind of uncomfortable for people to live by, but a perfect new urbanism design would have the first two floors of every building be commercial space. That's where there'll be restaurants, be services, be dentists, be clinics, be everything in commercial properties. But then the higher floors of every building in the whole dang city will be apartments. New urbanism hates individual housing. Everybody lives in an apartment. That's what the cities of the future are asking us to do. Okay? Uh, also, a lot more green spaces. New urbanism hates private yards. No front yard, no backyard, no garden, no place for your dog, sadly. So uh, you're going to have to share the public space. And I'll tell you this. For two years, I lived in an area of San Diego called North Park. And North Park, San Diego has a whole lot of gentrification. And they have so much of it where if you kind of looked at a tiny piece of North Park, you'd be like, oh, new urbanism strategies. So, once again, North Park is not new urbanism, because you gotta, you gotta start fresh in the whole dang city. But it's, uh, it's an experience that I've had that I'm sure I can talk quite a bit about. So, let's think. 
how is new urbanism good for cities and communities? I always love to have a class conversation during this part. But if everybody's really close together, you, you can just basically walk everywhere, maybe bicycle everywhere. Um, also, new urbanism loves any kind of like public transportation. Hopefully you get uh, a subway system, you get like a efficient bus routes going on. So that's, that's new urbanism loves that. So if you didn't have to drive everywhere and you could just walk everywhere, you'd have a significantly easier life. Um, and the number one thing causing pollution in almost every city from people is their cars. If you got rid of cars, then you would have significantly less pollution and you could save planet Earth and fight climate change. So there you go, fight climate change. Um, uh, what else? And cars need a whole lot of space. Like, here in Las Vegas, so many of our streets are, like, eight lanes deep. And also, so many commercial areas need these giant parking lots. Like, if we didn't need our cars, there'd be so much more physical space, and we could put apartment buildings and commercial buildings and stack them up instead of out, and it would be way more efficient for our lives and societies. So, pack it all together. That's what New Urbanism wants you to do and hates cars. That's a big part of the FRQ. All right, everybody good with this? All right, moving on. So check it out. First couple floors, businesses. It's like a mini shopping mall. And then these top floors, people live there. And that's newerism in a nutshell. All right, here's another thing, you know, the block. So, yep, this is where there's commercial businesses and that's where people live. Oh, hey. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, a Safeway is on the first floor. Oh, and a Smash Burger. Man, I love Smash Burger. And then right above here, that's where people live. And then, oh, hey, it's North Park. I used to live right here on Myrtle Avenue. But, oh, yes, yeah, look, a dog park. I told you, kids, it's the Dinks. The Dinks love this kind of stuff. Oh, and the San Diego Zoo. That's a great place. Um, and then, yeah, here's some pictures in North Park. I took these myself. So you can see on the first floor, these are some businesses, but on the top floors, people live there. And then, oh gosh, it's dogs. Every time, stupid dog grooming. And then in the uh, above floors, people live there. So there it is. And uh, okay, also, I lived in the city of Daejeon, South Korea for two and a half years. And Daejeon was designed with new urbanism strategies in mind. Oh my gosh, what a great example to use on the FRQ. Um, and yeah, I lived on the 16th floor of a giant apartment building. I think it was like 20 floors tall. Here, this is actually the building I lived in. I'll zoom in on it. And yeah, Daejeon was a really awesome city, quite honestly. Even if they gave me a car, I don't think I'd really use it. Because I lived on the 16th floor of this apartment building. The English school I taught at was two blocks away. So it was super easy to walk there. The... Uh, bar district where I hung out every weekend that was like four blocks away and right next to my apartment building literally right next to it I think I can even zoom in on it uh, there was a subway station I think this is it and this subway station connected me to the bullet train station and from the bullet train station I could get anywhere in the country in two hours so I I didn't need a car and then also you can see like you're like, oh, Mr. Brown, you lived in an apartment. That must have really sucked. But uh, I could walk around in this giant park zone right next to my building. And yeah, okay, of course, other people were there. But it's it's cool, you know? It's just sharing is caring and all that. So yeah, and Daejeon really did have a lot of bike paths. Here's another part of Daejeon. I'll zoom in on it. And uh, hardly anyone lived in a house. I mean, it was just kind of normal to say like, hey, what apartment do you live in? Because we just, everybody doesn't live in houses. And yeah, South Korea is in an especially difficult situation because they're a really highly populated country and they don't have a lot of space. So they sort of didn't have the same options like we had in America to just spread out suburbs and urban sprawl for days. Building up was their only option. But by confining to these new urban strategies, it's actually causing a significantly less environmental footprint. The city's far more efficient and effective. And quite honestly, I preferred Daejeon to living in California or Nevada. Uh, it was pretty great. It was a much more tight community. So, all right, let's check it out. So here it is, Daejeon, South Korea, my former home. Uh, let, let me read some things in Korean. 
Richie Bill. The Rich. The Richville. Town and home. Oh, man. That was my place. And then, yeah, Cherry Blossom Festivals. Oh, gosh. That was amazing. And then, yeah, here's sort of the uh, the bicycle highways they had in Dejan. And they got these, like, fountains that go off. And, man, oh, gosh. I've got some stories about the bicycle highways. Sometimes I would just sort of bike around this thing just to have fun. And one time I was I was bicycling down one of these roads like this. And I was going kind of fast, you know, had my headphones in. And there was this older Korean man who was bicycling on the other lane, like what I was biking on this lane, he was biking on this lane. And then for no reason, he merges into my lane and I crash into him. And, you know, like he falls off his bike and, and I get off my bike and I'm just like, oh, you know, and I, I, I ask him like, you know, uh, Gwen Chana, Gwen Chana yo. And, and he's like, rah, oh, I hate you. Uh. And, and I'm just like, dude, you were in my lane. Like you crashed into me. Uh, it was, it was a crazy day. Um, and yeah, here's the city of Dejan. Uh, Richibil was right here by Shi Chong Yok. Oh, I totally remember that statement. And uh, my my school is right here by the save zone. Good good place to save a school. Oh gosh, man. Huh. Oh, I have fond memories of of Dejan. Oh, Home Plus. That was like Walmart, but better. Oh gosh. And then yep, there it is. Dejan, a city of new urban theory. Oh man, it really made me effective at teaching this lesson because I live there. And then yep, there's the subway. It connects you to the bullet train. Everything else. Okay, so gentrification, yeah, I think I've already mentioned this, but I'm saying it again. Gentrification is the band-aid solution to a city that already has some problems with sprawl and with commuting issues. But new urbanism, it's massive gentrification. You're changing the entire community. You're, a, you're doing the urban planner thing, and you're designing a significantly better city from step one. So let's play the game. Is it gentrification or is it new urbanism? Here we go. I don't even want to read that, but it's gentrification. Okay? This one, it's also gentrification. This one, yes, you you, you got it. It's new urbanism. And one thing you guys are going to see is new urbanism, it's, yeah, like there are some examples in the United States and some examples in Europe. But for the most part, new urbanism is something happening in Asia. Because that's where they're building a lot of these new cities. They have the infrastructure and the uh, the planning wherewithal to build these new cities in these smart ways. Um, yeah, this is new urbanism for sure. Oh, look at how cool that is. Everyone's living in these giant apartments. All this green open space. There aren't even roads. Like, well, here's the thing. In a new urban planning system, there would be roads. Like, people are still going to order takeout food. And they've got to, like, bring in their move-in trucks but roads are not as big a deal in a new urban environment. And then, ooh, look at that. New urbanism for sure. Uh, okay, so the goals of new urbanism. I think I've already hit on them, but you're going to have to just see me hit on them again. Uh, but it's all about creating a tight sense of community, having a lot of open spaces. And, and that is something I've sort of seen in the United States. It's like people have these big front yards and backyards, and people hardly ever use them. Like, why not just combine everybody's front yard and backyard space into a giant green park and, like, have a festival there and, like, share it? Um, I know there's a lot of cities in the United States that have these sort of open festivals. Like, uh, this is a picture I took of the San Diego uh, Farmer's Market. This is a picture of the Austin what do they call it, like Austin Thursday night something, uh, yeah, but it was super fun, um, and I don't even remember where I took this one, but anyway, so many cities around the country have these events where they bring in food trucks, and they're like, come on out, everybody, and hang out and have a good time, um, oh, wait, oh, that was the Dallas Arts District, anyway, that's cool, uh, Las Vegas, we have something like this, hopefully the kids know, it's called First Friday, and, uh, a study by the National Academy of Sciences said trees reduce the temperature of a city by 10 degrees. Las Vegas is hot enough. Give us some dang trees. We got the water. We can make it happen. Okay, so yeah, there's San Diego, and there's Dallas, and there's just trees. Look at that, trees. And people are having a good time. Um, okay, so the official goals of new urbanism. Decrease long-distance commuting. People hate being stuck in traffic. 
commuting from one side of LA to the other. Why doesn't everybody just live in the middle? Okay, like Mr. Brown, there's like 8 million people in LA. You can build some really tall buildings, okay? Like anything's possible. Um, but yeah, newerism hates cars. Um, also, uh, it should be a less crowded on the roads. And if you got rid of the roads, you could just build more houses there. So that's a big solution to that. Um, people should utilize bicycles, buses, trolleys, subways. A lot of the other major cities in the world already do a lot of that stuff. But if we also got rid of cars, life could be better. So you're like, oh, Mr. Brown, I hate being in subways. I was in subways in South Korea. I survived. Um, oh, buses. Buses are terrible. Well, yes, buses are terrible in Las Vegas, but other parts of the world, they do them pretty well. And then what really sucks is traffic. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of traffic in this city, but in other parts of the country, traffic is terrible. And y'all look, these happy people bicycling to work. It's so much more efficient. Yeah, it sucks when you're just stuck in traffic literally for hours. Oh my gosh. And yeah, bike lanes. Let's make them happen. We could do that in Vegas. Anything's possible. Um, okay. So I'm going to show you some specific buildings now that are designed with new urbanism thoughts in mind. But for the most part, it's you're, you're incorporating green elements into the building. You are using the building as mixed development. So you're, you're really making uh, this idea that you're also saving the environment and saving the world. Um, if you're saving electricity, saving water, you're having less of an impact and then I also want to make this point too. If we built our cities upward and just kind of brought in all that land that we used to use for urban sprawl, then we could just give that land back to our animal and nature friends. Okay? Like, you wouldn't be at risk of eating a bat or a pelican and causing a global pandemic or anything like that. Like, leave the animals out there in the wilderness. Okay? Don't, don't eat them. Um, well, I mean, obviously eat animals, but do it in a productive way. So, uh, people should live in densely packed communities, requires less total land, people consolidate together instead of spread out. There we go. Let's talk about it. So, uh, here we go. The new urban way. Pack everything in, a lot more green space. It makes sense. Look at those windmills and all that other stuff there. And then, yep, pack it all in. Make it all happen together. Big old houses. And, oh, oh, man, oh, this is just, this is exactly what a new urbanism planner's dream looks like. So just imagine the first couple floors, that's where they sell stuff. People live up here, and there's just trees, and, oh, it's just so green and blue. Oh, it's amazing. And this is Los Angeles. It's trash. Los Angeles is the complete opposite of what new, new urbanism aspires to be. Los Angeles, the vast majority of buildings are two stories. It goes on for like 500 freaking miles. And it's this layer of smog and there's traffic and it's the worst. And then, oh, oh, look at this, this densely packed area over here. But then green space. Oh, Bambi and friends are just loving life. Okay, so mixed use development. People really like it because it's super convenient shopping. And it's true, kids. I remember when I was living in South Korea and I was like, oh, man. I'm hungry. I want to go eat some food. I just went to the first floor of my apartment building, went into the Kimbap Changguk, and I was like, hey, can I get a bowl of rice salad? And they're like, yeah, that'll be 2,000 Korean won, which translates to like a buck 50. So I paid a buck 50, and I never turned on my stove the entire two and a half years I lived there because I just had the old Korean lady on the first floor make me food every day. It was amazing. Um... And, uh, yeah, it's when you can also have a lot more healthy food options, too. Uh, a concept that also exists in a lot of American cities right now is something called food deserts. And when you're driving home and you see McDonald's and Taco Bell and Grinder, I don't, I don't even know what that is. But when you see all that kind of stuff and you just eat there all the time, you're not getting a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables in your life. And this scene right here is referred to as a food desert, where people are just constantly distracted by the, the fast food, fried food, fatty foods. They can't really get a lot of the quality stuff that you got to live a healthy life. And th there are legitimate parts of the United States, especially in some, quote, ghetto areas, 
that don't even have a single supermarket or grocery store because they're just not as used. Um, people just keep getting distracted by fast food. And the argument is, and I mean, it was true when I was living in South Korea, I did eat better food. That if people uh, are, you know, have a small market on the first floor of their apartment, they're going to have very easy access to fresh food and they'll probably eat it a lot more. And that's pretty great. Okay. Fresh food's more easily accessible. So yeah. So get, get away from food deserts, eat fresh food, live the good life. So here we go. Oh man. Oh, look at that little, I, I think this is Thailand, but yeah, they've got cut fruit. Oh gosh. I remember when I was in Bangkok, I, I, I was drinking strawberry milkshake things for like 50 cents. Gosh, I'd love to go back. And then, yep, there it is. Fruit and vegetable. Eat it up. Oh, man, people walking around. Fruits and vegetable markets. But then, food deserts. So, yeah, basically, you got your soda fries and shakes, things you high school kids love. But supermarkets, fresh vegetables, fruit stands, nowhere to be seen. And this is just the reality of so many uh, uh, large commercial streets. As people drive home, they, they see this and they ignore the good stuff. And then, yep, oh, affordable, healthy food on the horizon. Oh, no, all these fat Americans literally can't breathe because they're overweight. Uh, life's a struggle. Um, okay, so great examples of cities that utilize new urbanism right here in the United States. Uh, Reston, Virginia, ranked 29 in the best places to live in America. Uh, I'll zoom in on some pictures of Reston, but this is one of these newer kind of uh, suburban communities uh, I think both these are pretty close to Washington, D.C. Uh, and yeah, Reston, it was designed with new urbanism principles in mind. It, it's got footpaths, swimming pools, not as many roads. Everything's really close together. Bike lanes, dog parks, everything you could hope for. Uh, Columbia, Maryland, ranked number one of the best places to live in America by Money Magazine. If you are a fancy person who works in Washington, D.C., you probably live in Columbia. And yeah, Columbia, also everything I mentioned above, it's just the, the super new urbanism right here in the U.S. of A. So those are, those are two good examples. They might help you out in the FRQ. Who knows? Write them down. Uh, let's uh, look at some pictures now. So here's Reston. Oh, man, look at how closely packed it is. And look at all the green space. And yes, there are still some roads, but it's not about those big freeways, highways, parkways. It's like drive home. And once you're at home, you walk and you go everywhere you want to go. So, yep, these are kind of the big apartment buildings in Reston. And then the Reston Lake. And then Reston, Virginia. Oh, hey, everyone's having a good time. And then this is sort of their idea. They're just going to greenify the whole dang place. And then, oh, here's Columbia. It's super tightly packed together. And yeah, people walking around in Columbia, having a good time. The Columbia Villages. And then, yep, see, so there's there's the freeway. But then you get to Columbia, you park your car, and from there you just walk or bike everywhere. And then, oh, look, at these Colombian people having a great time. And then, yep, there's Columbia walking around living the dream. Uh, okay, if there's one building that identifies as new urbanism, it has to be the Interlace Apartment Complex in Singapore. Oh, man. I, I'm just impressed. I, I, I challenge you to count the apartment buildings that have been cleverly placed on top of each other in unique ways. And I know that on the first floors of these apartment buildings, it's all commercial real estate stuff. So commercial stuff and then the residential stuff. It, you basically, you go to the Interlace apartment building and you never have to leave. There's just thousands of people there, thousands of businesses. It's, it's a one building, one city. And this would have a new urbanism planner just excited. So... Look at this. I don't even know how many buildings that is on top of each other, but they're all interconnected, and it's it's just impressive. It's like some kid took Lego blocks and just went to town with them. Um, and then, yep, there's the Interlace Apartment Building in Singapore. Oh, wow, it's super cool. They're, they got pools. They got palm trees. Oh, gosh, why why would you ever leave? Yeah, see, see how it's all interconnected like that? One, two, three, four, five, six... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I don't know. There's like 30 buildings on top of each other. But they've got a party pool pavilion and, of course, a pet zone because dogs. Um, all right. Uh, what else we got here? Yeah, the Vertico Bosco. I already mentioned that one. Uh, Sejong City in South Korea. Let's check these out. So here's the Vertico Bosco in Italy. 
that, well, it's more gentrification than new urbanism because we're not redesigning the whole city. But if you made a whole city of vertical Boscos, you would be a new urbanism planner's dream. Um, here's just another really cool building because I, I think what they did was they took an old freeway and they converted it into a green space slash apartment space. And this would get a new urbanism planner just excited inside. Um, I don't even know what's going on here. I don't know what part of the world this is, but I saw this picture and I also got excited because there's no place for cars, but all kinds of place for trees and people to walk. And uh, yeah, you got some uh, restaurant here, living space here. Uh, I don't know where this place is either, but wow, that just looks really cool and it's designed in a really awesome way. So good job, new urbanism planning, make it happen. Um, all right, one more slide and then I'm all done. This has been going on long enough. But uh, why would people not like new urbanism? Hmm? This is where I'd have a discussion with the class, so I'll just fill you in with what I would hope the kids would say. Some people love their dang cars. And new urbanism doesn't approve of your car. So uh, especially here in the United States, like people put a lot of value in their car. They see their car as an extension of themselves. And... Also, people in the United States don't like walking. Like, man, I dated this girl one time. I, I parked the car on one end of the parking lot. I was like, let's walk to the movie theater. She's like, no, park closer. I'm like, come on, we should just walk. No, park closer. And uh, I, you know, just walk more, walk more. Some people hate walking. Uh, also, new urbanism, you don't get a front yard or a backyard. So that means no garden, no place for your dog. So let's check it out. Okay, so this is, once again, new urbanism theory right here. Oh, no, the riverfront, and then people live on the upper floors. That's so cool. Okay, here's why people would hate new urbanism. It's for probably a lot of the same reasons as gentrification, but here we go. Oftentimes, white people take over the neighborhood. The city loses a sense of community. New urbanism, the way it's being designed is it's all kind of fancy upscale living. Like, you're not going to find any low-income people in Renton, Maryland, or Columbia, or Renton, Virginia, or Columbia, Maryland. Like, those are exclusive, fancy, rich communities, which are new urbanism friendly. Um, yeah, many Americans, they like their big yard. They like their big garage. They like their privacy. They like their secluded space. I have a friend here in Las Vegas who has an eight-bedroom house. He really likes that. He has a room for his band stuff and two guest rooms and all this other th stuff. And in new urbanism, you don't get that. New urbanism, everybody lives in an apartment and the apartment probably is just, you know, two bedrooms. That's it. Um, yeah, new urbanism absolutely hates cars and parking would be a major problem if America snapped its fingers and converted to new urbanism theories. And yes, increase rent prices. Some people can't afford the new look of things. So yeah, so many dogs. Uh, they all have to share a dog park. And some people want their own private space for their dogs. And then oh, <laughs> private property, keep out. They'll be, what does that say? Prosecuted. Oh, sorry. I thought it said something else. Um, dear tourists, welcome to Venice. We hope you're enjoying all this beauty. You're also lucky. This is the last generation that'll enjoy this culture. Are you staying in an Airbnb? Uh, if so, then you're responsible for destroying this dang city. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, some people really like to live in their old community. They don't want it to change. Um, East Austin Pride. Yeah. And uh, I remember when I went to East Austin, not a lot of black people live there anymore. It was pretty gentrified. Um, yeah, Seattle rents are soaring. Sometimes rent's going up, what, Seattle 10% every year. Um, when these cities keep getting more and more popular, they're going to push out people who can't afford it. Tends to be minorities. Um, and then, yeah, look how tightly packed these cars are. Imagine if you got this driver's seat. You couldn't pull out. You don't have any room to go forward or backward. The car's stuck. And then, yeah, some, some days be like this. You know, you can't find a parking space, so you park where you can. All right, that's it for me. Uh, I do have an FRQ directly co correlated with this uh, presentation. 
So if you're one of my students, uh, send me an email and I will send you that FRQ. And you'll do it and you'll send it back to me and I'll tell you how you did. All right. So with that, peace out.